Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of John's Gospel. It'll be John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. <coughs> John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, reading to verse 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may you give us ears to hear your words and not mine. Eyes, Lord, to see the way that you lay before us, the path you stretch and call us to walk. God, may you give us hearts eager to receive what you have for us and the courage, the courage, Lord, to pursue what it is you call us to do. Be with us now, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, about 140 years ago, a man named Alexander Graham Bale raced another man named Elisha Gray to the patent office in order to receive a patent for his innovation, his invention, that would later come to be known as the telephone. And as you probably know, Alexander Graham Bale beat the man to there. About five years after filing his patent, there were over 132,000 telephones in, some, in a person's house. But by 1930, that number had grown to well over 15 million. And ever since its introduction, the telephone has certainly undergone a great deal of change as it's evolved. In the beginning, phone calls were just that. They were calls. You picked up a receiver, and an operator connected wires between your line and someone else's, and your voice would carry over that line. But then came the innovation of a rotary dial. Any of y'all ever use a rotary dial? You know the sound, right? Did you ever get frustrated when you had to dial 9, and it didn't make it all the way around? And so you'd hang up and have to do it all over again. But it was seen as an innovation. You had somebody's number, and you could use the rotary dial to call them. But then came the touch-tone phone, and you could just push the button. Boop, boop, boop. Dial them directly. It was, a ma it was magic. But then came cordless phones. Now, I know none of you were as classy as my dad, uh, but when he had a cordless phone, you know, the kind with the antenna, he'd put it in his back pocket. And walk, he'd, he'd ride to the store with that darn cordless phone in his back pocket like it was going to pick up 10 feet away from the receiver. Maybe he was a man ahead of his time. I don't know. But then came caller ID. I remember the commercials for caller ID. And I remember what my mama said when she found out we could get caller ID. Oh, now, good. I, don't, I know which phone calls not to answer when they call. And then the device that has defined, well, a century probably, the mobile phone, the cell phone. Phones could leave the house now. They could be carried in a bag, installed in your car. They looked like big gray plastic bricks that you could walk around with, but you could talk to somebody on that brick. But as they became popular, 
And as technology advanced, they got smaller and more affordable. And before too long, you could carry one on your belt. And maybe if your pants are big enough, one in your pocket. And then in the 90s, cell phones became more than just portable telephones for the upper class used exclusively for making phone calls. Oh, no. They became entertainment devices because you could play games like Snake. So you laugh, you know what I'm talking about. You're just following a little dot on this tiny little screen. But you can do it. People would do it for hours. They could play music. You could set it to ring with a song. My phone in college rang with the theme song from Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was wonderful. I love getting phone calls from bum, 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 like every time somebody called. You could do all kinds of things. And then cell phones became small computers, able to send and receive emails, take pictures and shoot video in high definition. And now in like virtual reality, it's crazy. You can download files, you can keep track of your, your schedule and all of your contacts. These smartphones have become so popular, it's estimated that over a billion people in the world use smartphones now. And most people access the internet not through a traditional computing system, but through their phones. The telephone has come an awful long way since Mr. Gray and Mr. Bell raced to the patent office. But it's a clear example to me of how an idea, how an invention can only get more useful, more important with each iteration of its introduction. But there are those ideas, those inventions, those processes that begin as good ideas. And along the way, as they evolve, they become less helpful, maybe even harmful. Take, for instance, the way we preserve food. Why, just a few generations ago, there was no such thing as organic produce. There was no such thing as locally grown, farm-raised, free-range livestock. You know why? They were all that way. Where'd you get your chickens? Not down at the store. In the backyard. That's where you did it. But somehow, in the middle of the 20th century, we decided, and some of you probably heard commercials or read advertisements that said this, we would have better living through chemistry. And so we developed chemical preservatives for our foods, new pesticides that would yield larger crops. And we, we genetically engineered produce so that it would resist these pesticides, but also kind of rob some of the fruit and vegetables of their flavor and their nutrients. And we developed ways that we could ship them across the country. We could pick them green, put them in a trailer, fill that trailer full of gas, and they would somehow magically ripen as they got across the country. We did all of these things, I think, with good intentions, with the initial intention of making food cheaper and available year-round, and it started out as a good idea. But of course, these days we know of the health hazards of most of these preservatives, how the chemistry uh, we thought would once give us better living has only led to carcinogen-laced foods and tasteless tomatoes. It's good. It seems that not all things that start out as a good idea, with good intentions, and right motives, evolve into something that can truly improve the quality of life. And I suppose, I suppose one can make the case that the temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, well, it sort of falls into this kind of category. You see, the, the first temple is not the one that Jesus worshipped at and the disciples worshipped at. The first temple was built by Solomon around the year 957 B.C. It replaced the elaborate tent that the Israelites were using during this period of wilderness wandering. Solomon's temple was attacked several times after its construction and eventually destroyed by the Babylonians around the year 586 B.C. And according to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the Jewish people were released from exile under the Persian king Cyrus, they returned to Jerusalem and they built another much smaller, less impressive temple, somewhere around the year 515 B.C. Now this little temple would stand for some time and see its share of rulers attempt to worship idols within its walls, seek to tear it down. But it was around the year 20 B.C. that King Herod the Great, you know the one from the Christmas story? Herod the Great began an elaborate renovation project that would restore the temple to its former glory. And it was in this iteration of the Jewish temple that Jesus would have worshipped. 
Now, while Herod's temple was elaborate and beautifully adorned, in fact, I think it's Josephus who said, you could see it shining on the hill, on the horizon, a little gleaming dot, way off. It had come a long way from the center of worship it had been in Solomon's day. You see, in order to accommodate for the pilgrims who had traveled from distant lands, livestock was being sold in the courts of the temple for sacrifices. Actually, the book of Deuteronomy says this is okay. For if God had blessed you richly and you lived far off and had a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep that you had to bring for sacrifice, the book of Deuteronomy says, well, you can sell it, bring the money, and buy something local so you're not having to, you know, scoop up the refuse on the way. That's what it says. But as you can imagine, this presents a bit of a problem in Jesus' day because the currency used for temple sacrifices and for temple businesses was not the same as the currency used for the empire. Rome would not allow the Jewish people to establish their own currency. So money changers had to be brought in. People had to come and say, all right, bring your Jewish money, but we got to give you Roman money. Or bring your Roman money, and we got to give you Jewish money before you can buy these sacrifices. And so they set up tables in the courts, at the entrances of these courts, for the pilgrims to come in and have the proper currency to do the proper transactions, to have the proper sacrifices. Well, as you can imagine, both the sellers of the livestock and the money changers found themselves quite busy, especially at a time like Passover. And so, as these folks who were busy, they do what, what, what most enterprising folks do. Hey, you know what? These, these devout pilgrims, these people who are coming to worship God, why, I bet they'd pay a little bit more for a cow. These folks who were coming, you know what? I bet if they had to change their money, why, I bet. I know, I know, I know Leviticus says we shouldn't, and Exodus says we shouldn't be charging interest, but you know they'll probably pay it. And so these sellers of livestock, these money changers, they began to make a little scratch, make a little bit of money. They began to turn a profit. This is all acceptable in our world, in, in the business world. Ask anybody. Yeah, there's demand and supply, and if you got it and they don't, you can charge more for it. But before long, before long, it was the business that began to dominate the Temple Mount. It became easy to see the Temple not as a holy site, not as a place of worship, not as the residence of God Almighty, but as a place of obligatory custom, a place to do business. The temple had become a machine, a corporation, a center for commerce. It was a tourist site. And as with all tourist sites, there were those who I'm sure were out on the outside selling keychains with their names on them. Folks out there selling airbrushed t-shirts. I've been to Jerusalem and saw the temple, right? There are folks wheeling and eager to capitalize on the opportunity for all of this mass potential for customers. It was a commercial circus. We're told in verse 13, and then Jesus came to celebrate the Passover. Now, the events that took place on that day in the, are familiar to us, to any of us who've read the Gospels, but John does something interesting. The others put it at the end, at Holy Week. Not John. John sticks it right at the beginning. Jesus sets out in John's Gospel with a message for the temple. Right in verse 15, we see Jesus reacting to the scene before him in the temple. He makes a whip of cords. He drives out all of the uh, uh, sheep and the cattle from the temple. He poured out the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables. But why does Jesus act this way? After all, everybody who reads this goes, I don't sound like Jesus. This doesn't sound like the, the, the calm, mild-mannered Jesus. In fact, what do most people say? He's angry. But why does Jesus act this way? If this is how things were, if this is how things were supposed to act, if everybody accepted it, if this was how the religious machine worked in the first century, then why is Jesus lashing out at those who are just playing the part of which they've grown accustomed? Well, listen to his words in verse 16. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus enters the temple, looked around, saw nothing more than a marketplace, an area to do business. Not a temple. No longer was it a place of holiness or reverent worship. Rather, the temple had become a place for the faithful few to wade through the immoral and irreverent practices of those seeking to make a profit. 
and those seeking to simply make their cultural obligation to just acknowledge this is my religious heritage. I'll show up every once in a while, every time there's a festival, every time, you know, Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day. I'll show up. I'll let everybody see me. Is it any wonder? Jesus, the son of the God to whom this temple was built, takes such bold action when he enters the temple. Now, in verses 17 and 18, we see the way other people respond to Jesus' actions. His disciples remember, oh yeah, zeal for your house will consume me. And then the Jews, as John likes to label them, said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? They don't get it. They want to know why in the world is Jesus behaving like this? Where do you get off flipping over the tables, running out the cows and, and all the livestock? Don't you know they cost money? Where do you get off doing this? Doesn't he understand that these people rely on their income here in the temple? Doesn't Jesus understand that this is the way the temple works now? This is the way we've always done it. Don't you know that, Jesus? They want some sort of sign, some justification as to why, why Jesus has done it. But Jesus only answers them in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. And all they can say is, well, this temple's been under construction for 46 years. You think you can do it in three days? Have at it, buddy. We're still working on it. Stuff we started 46 years. There were people who were born and died. while it was. I think it's the same people who were working on I-20. They were born and they died, and Herod's temple was still under construction. It's as if they only understood the temple in terms of the stones that built the walls and the money that changed hands. It's like they only thought about the temple as the gold gilding and the, the polished marble and the white steeples and the stained glass. And the vacuum carpet. They seem to only be concerned about the influx of pilgrims and the money to be made at such a large celebration like Passover. Jesus challenges them, destroy it, tear it down, destroy the temple, and the evangelist lets us in on what he means. He was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. They didn't understand then. They completely missed the point of the temple. What's odd about it to me is if you go back and read all the way back at the beginning, God's never really interested in this sort of thing in the first place. Even right down to the altars that the, the uh, patriarchs of the faith construct. God tells them, don't cut them with chisels, don't shape them, just take some rough rocks and pile them up. That's enough. Because you know what happens when you start to shape them? When you start to build them, when you start to put them in place, when you start to make buildings, when you start to make temples, do you know what happens? It becomes less about the God you worship and more about the rocks stacked on top of one another. So over the generations, the temple went from this pious attempt to create a central location for the worship of God to nothing more than an expensive complex for commerce. This wasn't Jesus cleansing the temple. I don't care what the little heading over your Bible says. This wasn't Jesus cleansing the temple. This was Jesus completely rejecting what the temple had become. And with his words, Jesus teaches us that the true temple, the true dwelling place of God, is not found inside some box made with gold, bricks, or sheetrock. The true temple of God is found in Christ. So let's imagine for a moment, it's getting close to Easter, uh, let's imagine for a moment it's Easter, perhaps the closest thing we Christians have to Passover, both in terms of on our calendar and in its grandness of celebration. And Jesus has come to church. Maybe our church, maybe a different one. What would he witness? What about any given Sunday? Think about some of these churches Jesus would walk in and, oh, they're selling coffee for $5 a cup over in the corner. Or the pastor's got his face on all the books. Mine are coming, they'll be out there. 
pastor's got his face on all the books there in the foyer. Would Jesus see a group of people coming together to worship the Almighty God with hearts filled with hope, joy, and reverence? Seeking encouragement, seeking conviction and challenge? Would he witness a multitude of believers gathered under one roof out of love for God and one another? You know, sometimes I wonder if he'd even be let in the door. Would people greet him with a genuine smile? Perhaps a warm hug to let him know he's welcome here in the house of God. Is that what Jesus would witness? Or would he see a machine? A corporation? Simply trying to survive out of a small desire to meet a cultural norm? Would he see individuals, not a group, gathered together in order to simply feel better about what's going on, about what's, what's going to happen to them after they die? Would he witness a group of people who were only interested in seeing more people like them come into the business in order to generate more money so more people like them could come into the business to generate more money so that the whole machine can grind on and on without the slightest bit of sacrifice and devotion from those who claim his name? Would he witness that in some of our churches? Would he come into this room today Walk down the aisle, pouring out the offering plates, driving us out, flipping over the pews, driving us out in rejection of what the church has become. I wonder sometimes if we in the church, the capital C church, if we are missing the point of all of it. I thought about this as I was reading it, and I thought about some of my friends in ministry. I thought about us. I thought, no, surely... This wouldn't happen. But then I, I, I have friends who say, yeah, yeah, try talking about changing the address of the building where you're at. Try moving out of the steeple and into a storefront. You'll see what happens. Yeah. Are we missing the point of it all? Do we fail to understand what it means to be Christ's church? The temple of God. I wonder... If we as the universal church have let generations of evolutions, decades of so-called advancements and improvements in ministry lead us away from our calling as Christ church. Let us begin then this day, this very day, every single one of us to come together to be Christ's church. Let us shake loose those things we've come to expect as acceptable if they lead us further from the one true calling as followers of Christ and worshipers of God. Because I'm going to tell you, friends, and I'm saying this to somebody who's you know, in the business. There's a lot of junk that distracts us. There is a lot of junk that we've put in the way. A lot of tables we've set up in the foyers of God's temple. A lot. So let us shake loose those things. It's time to raise the temples we've built. To raise the temple of God in Christ Jesus is the only thing that matters. To turn over the tables. To reverse the habits and practices that cause us to be little more than a religious machine. And I don't mean that just as our church, it's First Baptist Week. I'm talking about the whole church, every believer who's there. To overturn those things that make religion just some rigmarole, just some rhythm we go through, just some thing we do to check a box. It's time to turn the tables of apathy that allow us to feel as if we're accomplishing something simply because we claim to have the desire to see those things accomplished. It's time to turn the tables and raise the temples we've built that have brought us to a place where we can say, well, you know, that's the way it's always been. As if it's some sort of righteous justification. It's what they said to Jesus. Give us a sign. We do this all the time. This is the way we've always done it. It's time for us, Christ's church, to turn the tables and raise our temples and begin focusing on the things which are eternal. Or I'm afraid. I'm afraid Christ may just turn the tables over on us one day. That he may just reject the whole machine that we've come to call the church. Because he calls us to so much more. To so much more. To see past the things we put in our way. To see the calling that he gives to each of us. That's so simple. And yet so hard. To love God. 
and to love each other. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us when we, like those worshipers in the temple in your day. God, when we see the religious machinery we've created, it's been handed to us. God, when we see it as the point of all of life, Help us, God, to know that you call us to something beyond all of this. That you call us to something deeper. That you call us to the true work of your kingdom. Which is to love you. To love each other. And to call others deeper into that love with us. The Holy God, speak to us in this time. Raise whatever temples we have built to the ground. Help us to see that the only place where you reside is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Call us, God, and give us the strength to answer and the courage to follow. In your holy name we pray. Amen.